And it's great to be with you. You know, I've had the privilege of working with the Vital Smarts team for about, the six, for about six years collaborating on things. When they first came out to visit me uh, up in Ithaca, New York, I, I, there's instant chemistry and magic, and every time they've come back, we've really felt, I've really felt blessed. But I had a really great experience three years ago because I was asked to come and give uh, one of the, two of the talks back then. And I realized that one of the reasons I love those guys so much is one of the reasons I love most of the trainers who are here so much too. And that is, you are real believers, okay? You believe that you can change others, that you can make their lives better. And there's something really powerful about being positive. Now, I'm also gonna end the day with a talk, and I'm gonna end my last slides with, I'm gonna loop back to that positiveness. But one of the things we need to keep in mind is that although we believe in learning and elevated learning, that's not the solution in every case. In fact, if you only take one thing away from this morning's talk, it's gonna be this. It's easier sometimes to change your environment than it is to change your mind. Okay? Not just for you, but for your family, for some of the people you work with. It's a lot easier to put a fruit bowl with two kinds of fruit in the middle of your kitchen counter than it is every day to say, you know, I should really eat more fruit. Because <laughs> that way it just happens. You don't even have to think about it. Here's what we're gonna look at today is we're gonna look at what you can do and you can help others do to change what and how much they eat. Now, how many people have never, ever, ever seen these trends of how fat we are state by state? <laughs> okay. okay, they're color-coded, and the colors represent the percentage of people who are overweight in the state. And you can see what happened from 1991. We were kind of a, more of a trim country. In 1996, we had to add new colors. And now it's gotten to the point, even in 2003, where we even had to come up with different colors, you know, being that overachieving country we are. <laughs> well, I wanted to look at what would happen if this trend continues? What would 2025 look like, okay? You guys ready for this? <laughs> okay, I, I totally made that up. <laughs> It's kind of a problem, and here's what we're gonna look at today, is how things can be solved with win-win activism. Because the thing is, if you are positive, and if you do have a high degree of belief that you can change things like you folks do, there are miraculous things you can do, not just in your own home, but in your community and across the world, okay? So here's a roadmap. We're gonna start today with Chinese buffets, <laughs> then we're gonna go to school lunchrooms, your home, and then we're gonna end up with your country, whatever that country is, okay? So here's a couple starting points. Do we know what we like, and do we know why we do what we do? Well, the short answer to both is no, okay? But that's actually good news, because if we're not quite as set in what we think we like as we are, we can actually change our preferences. We can change what our kids eat. We can change what kids eat in school, or we can change what happens in company workplaces. And if we don't know why we do what we do, then it becomes even easier to do this without having to educate them, okay? Well, let's take a look. Do we, know what we like? do we know what we like? Well, a while back, this guy who's sitting down there, he came to me and he owned a restaurant. And he said, you know, here's the deal. I offer really, really healthy food, but the problem is nobody buys it. You know, they bake things instead of fry things and so forth. And he said, is there anything we can do? And we did a series of studies, and one of the things we did was simply as silly as changing the names of the foods. Because we know that we taste with our mind. Okay, your expectation of how good that chicken sausage was this morning, okay, totally influenced whether you liked it or not. Like if you said, I don't know, I'm gonna give this a shot, but I really don't know. When the person next to you says, what do you think of the chicken sausage? You're gonna say, I really don't know. <laughs> you thought it was gonna be good, it was good. So what we did was we took things like seafood filet, we took it off the menu for a couple weeks, and we put it back on, but we called it succulent Italian seafood filet. <laughs> now, <laughs> I mean, this is just a dried out fish stick. <laughs> In fact, I think the same fish stick that was there two weeks ago, actually. <laughs> but, but it didn't matter. People said, oh my God, this is incredible. They liked it better. They rated the restaurant as more trendy and up to date. They rated the chef as having more years of culinary training. 
I mean, he'd been fired like a month earlier from Arby's, you know. <laughs> but the thing was, it didn't matter how ridiculously stupid these words were, these descriptions we put in front of items. It always made people think it tasted better than it otherwise would. So when we took this terribly dry chocolate cake and renamed it Belgian Black Forest Double Chocolate Cake, people are like, oh, oh, it's incredible, it's great. I mean, it doesn't even matter that um, the Black Forest isn't in Belgium. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, Antwerp, ah. <laughs> But we wanted to see how far we could take this. So one of the things we did was we have a research restaurant. It's a restaurant that's like any other restaurant, but it's only open one night a week. People come in, they get a prefix meal, like um, three or four courses for maybe 25 bucks. And what we want to look at is whether the very first thing that happens during a meal can bias or poison the whole rest of the meal. So what we did, People came in, and about a month earlier, we bought all these cases of wine. It's called Charles Shaw Wine. <laughs> Sells for $2. What do they, what do they call it? <laughs> Two bucks chuck is what they call it, yes. We took all the labels off, and we replaced it with labels that either said it was from California, a place known for wine, or that is from North Dakota. <laughs> Place less known for wine. <clears throat> so what happened when people arrived is the waiters or waitresses went to this half of the room and they gave everybody, they said, hey, thanks for keeping your appointment. It's you know, snowy outside. Um, as a thank you, we have a complimentary glass of wine. It's, it's new from California. Poured everybody a glass and put the bottle right in the table. For the other half of the tables, the waiters or waitresses did the exact same thing, but they said, thanks for keeping your appointment or your reservation. As a thank you, we have a complimentary glass of wine. It's new from North Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> then they just indignantly put that bottle right there to remind you the whole night. <laughs> now what happened is that if you thought you're drinking California wine, even though they're the exact same wines, you love the wine more, you love the meal more, you ate longer, and when we asked you if you wanted to make reservations to come back, many of you did. You people had a much less magical time. <laughs> you didn't like the wine as much, you didn't like the food as much, and when we asked if you wanted to make reservations to come back, most of you didn't. And one guy even said, no, he says, uh, I'm really, really busy for the rest of my life. <laughs> now, I, I know this would never happen to us, okay? Well, let's take a look, though, at what might happen to some other unsuspecting people. Rainforest smoothie. It's unbelievable how suggestible our taste is. I'm Brian Wansink. Hi. To demonstrate that, Wansink tricked some of our own staff, seven of 2020's college interns. First, he added some chocolate sauce to vanilla yogurt. Then he told the students... We're gonna be doing a little strawberry yogurt taste test. Okay. On the table, he had some strawberry yogurt containers. So if you could put your blindfolds on... What the students put on blindfolds, tasted the yogurt, and then Wansink asked them to compare the strawberry tastes. I think they both tasted really strong with strawberry. All the students were certain they were eating strawberry yogurt. This one had a much stronger strawberry taste to it. Oh, it just tasted more like strawberry. With this woman, Wansink tried something different. We're gonna be tasting a couple of different kinds of yogurts today. Okay. He didn't tell her what flavor it was, so when he asked her to rate the strawberry taste. Honestly, okay. I didn't notice it's strawberry. Okay, good. And yet, by the time I interviewed the group, she too had accepted the idea that she'd eaten strawberry. When you like follow up with a question like, which one is more strawberry? I was like, I had to choose one. They all believed it was strawberry. Actually, none of them was strawberry. It was vanilla yogurt with chocolate sauce. <laughs> Stop. That can't be. What do you mean it can't be? Well, I, I thought I tasted strawberry. I guess also, when I opened my eyes, the two yogurts in front had a strawberry on the box. I think you're joshing us right now. I do. Because I, I feel like they, there was definitely a taste of strawberry. No, it was vanilla yogurt with chocolate sauce. 
but you thought it was strawberry. What? It tasted like strawberry. I swear it did. <laughs> the moral to these stories, says Juan Sink, is that we are much less taste sensitive than we think we are. We don't want to really believe that we are duped or fooled by something as simple as the... Now that's actually good news, because if by simply reframing something in somebody's mind, we can change their evaluation of it, we can encourage a lot of people to do things that are best for their health or best for the way they learn that they think they don't want to do. I mean, if you uh, are a mediocre cook and all of a sudden you're having somebody special over for dinner that you want to really have a good time, well, there's very easy things you can do to change their expectations. You can play nice music, you can have candlelight, you can serve off of plates and not off a napkin. <laughs> Any of those things move people in the right direction. And we're going to see how you can do that in a much bigger way in a little bit. But here's the second thing. Do we know why we do what we do? <laughs> and just the answer is clearly no. <laughs> no, think back to your last buffet. Do you know why you really took what you took? Now we think we do, but we really don't. But what's interesting about buffets, especially like Chinese buffets, is there's a lot of laws that are being suggested that will either charge us as buffet goers a big price, because buffets are bad. They'll charge the buffet owners a big surcharge every year, a big tax, just to have a buffet. And there's even laws out there that are trying to get people to zone buffets. So they have to be kind of on the outer side of outskirts of towns, you know, with all those other seedy places. <laughs> But something's interesting, if you ever go to a buffet, at least a third of the people there are really, really skinny. Now what is it that skinny people do at buffets that heavy people don't? Because if we knew that, there might be some solutions. But the problem is you can't go to a skinny person and say, what do you do differently at buffets that heavy people don't? Because what are they gonna say? They're gonna say one of two things. One thing they're gonna say is, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> the other thing they might say is, well, I, I eat less, followed by, I don't know. So you can't ask people, but you can watch them. So that's what we did. We went to, we took 12 coders and watched 370 diners in seven states across the country. From the moment they came in to the moment they left, and we coded everything. The number of chews they made per mouthful, how many times they went up, really. <laughs> All these different things. We realize that there's about five things that skinny people do differently than heavy people. Do you want to guess what one of those might be? What does a skinny person do at a buffet that a heavy person doesn't? Eat slowly. Eat slowly. Yeah, in fact, what they do is they chew about 15 times per average bite compared to 11. Sit farther away. Yeah, they sit farther away, and that's when we find they, on average, they sit 15 feet farther away from the buffet than the heavy person. And they're three times as likely to face away from the food. Heavy people face right toward the food. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're also almost 70% of skinny people, what they do is they, they will scout out the food before they serve themselves. In contrast, about 70% of heavy people go straight and pick up a plate and then start serving themselves. They're also more likely to use a smaller plate than you can use chopsticks too. <laughs> so, here we are, our thin diner. Is there a heavy diner? I think, he, I think he put him a little close to the buffet. <laughs> I didn't mean to eat at the buffet. But one of the things we find is that there's great news you can use here. If you're a dietitian, you're a public health person, you can say, look, next time you go to the buffet, scout it out, sit far away, face away, use a small plate, use chopsticks. But there's also somebody else who's really interested in, in, in information like this. Who would that be? Yeah, the buffet owner. Shortly after the study came out, the buff, this guy called and he said, you know, he says, um, my dad owns some Chinese buffets in central Pennsylvania. I'm, I'm gonna ask you a second, how many of you are imagining when I say some buffets in central Pennsylvania? And he said, do you think we could use this to get people to eat less? Now, does he care about the health of the people who are eating there? <laughs> no, he, he cares about making money. And we thought, well, still, it's a win-win thing. So yeah, we said, why don't you have the hostess seat people far away from the buffet, um, give them small plates, give them chopsticks, they, they can ask for a fork if they want, and let's put the plates behind the buffet so people have to walk around the buffet to pick it up. 
And, um, and let's put some plants or some folding screens every once in a while just to break it up so people can't just go, kind of go. <laughs> so it was interesting, about nine months later, the guy called and he says, hey, can I come up, come up and visit? And I said, sure. So he drove up, it was about six hours from where he lived. And he said, oh man, he says, uh, things really went well, but boy, it took nine months. They said, how did it take nine months to implement five changes? How, now, how many buffets were you thinking his dad owned when he said some? Yeah, I was thinking like maybe three or four, yeah. I said, how, how? I said you could have done that stuff in a weekend. And he goes, no. He goes, my dad's got 63 buffets. <laughs> we asked him how much uh, he, whether it was working. He goes, yeah, he says, he says uh, I think on average we calculate that we're going to save about $38,000 at the end of the year per buffet. <clears throat> So there's a lot of win-win solutions here. The idea is to come up with what are these win-win things that we can give grocery stores or schools or work sites so that they can make more money helping us make the right choices. And I call this win-win activism. But let's look at what this looks like in schools. Now, anybody who has kids or even cares about what goes on in schools has probably heard about the school lunch problems. I got a call from the Los Angeles Times a while back that said, hey, you know what we should do is we should just eliminate all unhealthy or tasty foods from schools and just keep like kale and lettuce. <laughs> tofu. Tofu on Fridays. <laughs> tofu Tuesday, yeah. <laughs> well, they did something like that and guess what happened a year later? Yeah, just people stopped eating there because kids always have a choice. I'll give you two examples though. There's a, the New York State Department of Health called and said, hey, you know, we want to sell more fruit in buffets. How much do we need to change the price? in order to sell more fruit. Here's what a lunch line looks like in upstate New York. That fruit is in this dingy chafer pan. It looks like a family-sized bed pan. <laughs> and the darkest part of that line. And you know, changing the price of fruit five cents is probably not gonna make any difference. So here's what we said. Just put it in a nice bowl and put it in a well-lit place. Now, the five schools did that. Sales of fruit didn't go up 5%, they went up 102%. Uh, one school, um, two schools didn't do it because they said it's not gonna work. And then one school did it wrong and it still worked. Okay, they, they say, how, how, how can you do that wrong? <laughs> they, 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 put, they put it in a nice bowl and then they took a desk lamp out of the closet and put it right next to me. <laughs> <laughs> we, we thought it was pretty funny, and we said, well, how did that work? And they said, hmm, sales went up 183%. <laughs> Shortly after that, we got a call from the USDA, and they said, look, 63%, 66% of all high schools have salad bars, but kids just don't eat there. How can we change it? One of the things that you do, if you take a look at a school lunchroom. Kids come in the upper right-hand corner, they have a la carte items, hot lunch items, a couple cash registers, and the salad bar that is more like a compost pile. <laughs> it's, just, it's just been there, it's, it's been there ever since the beginning of uh, the building of the school. <laughs> it's mulch, you can see steam rising over it. And we said, well, change the price is gonna work, but maybe do this, move it 10 feet. So all of a sudden what you have is the kid who's gotten, <laughs> the ninth grader who's gotten pizza for 102 out of the last 102 school days. He's getting his pizza and he's going, boom. <laughs> yes, hmm, hmm. this coming? It's like an alternative reality. <laughs> and, he, and he finally walks around, but what happens is that after about, after about three weeks, two to three weeks, he starts picking things up, and we found that in daily salad sales increased 200 to 300% simply by moving the salad bar. Now, there's a ton of these changes that can be made in any context. We're looking right now just at school lunchrooms that can increase the good stuff kids take and decrease the number of cookies they get. And what we did is we put a bunch of these together, and we started something a while back called the Smarter Lunchroom Movement, which is now in 25,000 U.S. schools, just making these simple changes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, the state of Utah is bringing us out in two months to do this. 
But one of the things we find is that as simple as many of these changes are, you almost can't go wrong. Even when you implement them wrong, they still work. Now, I'll give you an example here. Uh, <laughs> hearty vegetable soup, clam chowder. <laughs> Just look at what happens when you implement this stuff. The masterminds behind the cafeteria redesign are Cornell University professors David Just and Brian Wansick. I wanted to know how they're going to basically trick teens into eating right. So what are we doing here? The first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a bunch of the milk, put it in front so if a person's thirsty, at least they have the option of picking something up. At least they have to reach over the white milk if they want to pick up right. a uh, flavored sugared beverage. Step two. They took the pizza, which was the first thing in the lunch line, and moved it towards the back. And the veggies and the healthy bean burrito moved right to the front. Step three, they renamed the healthy food. We find that changing something as small as calling these mixed vegetables California blend or the big bed bean burritos increased <laughs> sales by about 27%. Step four, they moved the fruit from a plastic tub into a pretty fruit bowl. And finally, they took the cookies and put them just out of reach. They're going to have to ask one of the food service workers to help pick it up. We think that's just enough of a barrier to keep some percentage of kids from saying, ah, oh, whatever, I'll have an orange. The professors rolled up their sleeves, made their changes, and now it's lunchtime. Oh, there she's getting her tray. She grabbed a sandwich. She's oh getting God. an Arizona iced tea, I think. An orange juice. Ah, oh, and she got the cookie. <laughs> so, Samantha, this time you didn't get the cookie and you got a piece of fruit instead. Why'd you get the fruit this time? Why, why do you think? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this was an unbelievable success. Fruit increased by 102% simply by putting it in a nice bowl. The sweet drinks were also harder to get to, and Jane, Marcy, Richie, and Levante fell right into our trap. Last time they grabbed Gatorade, Snapple, and Arizona iced tea, but this time... Well, the water was just in front, so I just grabbed it. Sales of sugary drinks plunged by 17%, while purchases of easy-to-reach milk soared 46%. Whatever was easiest to reach, that was good enough for them. And that was enough to get them to change. Another hit, the Big Bad Bean Burrito, sold out for the first time ever. The professors say, on average, students' plates this time around contained about 18% fewer calories. And they made healthier choices. <laughs> Thank you! <laughs> now, what was it Samantha said when he said, why did you eat a cookie last time and you got a piece of fruit this time? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that's why this stuff works so well. But it doesn't just work well with junior high kids. It works well. We made over all the Google cafeterias in the United States. And the very next day, Googlers, smart as they are, are eating better. We've made over about five army bases in the U.S. And the very next day, all these... Soldiers carrying M16s and uh, hand, side guns, they eat better too. This works with everybody because most of us aren't very conscious about most of the decisions we make about food or mo most anything else during the day. So I think the key to doing this is not just saying, here are a couple changes to make, make them, but actually using a person's internally competitive self um, to help. One thing that we've developed is a self-assessment scorecard where a person goes through and they check anything they do, but they have to total up the score. So there's an objective score between zero and 100 that says, am I, as a food service director, making my kids fat or am I making them skinny? Am I ma making them heavy or healthy? And simply having to come up with a score and saying, 35? Jeez, I can do better than that. And most of these things I can change overnight. It's been a very powerful tool here. And our goal with my lab is by the year 2020 to have 70% of all U.S. public schools get a 70 or higher on this. Thank you. Looking hard. Um, the last thing I'm wearing, second last thing I want to look at is your home. Okay? Is your home making you heavy or healthy? I'm going to ask you a 10-point questionnaire. And we're going to see, when I ask you a question, if, you, if the answer is yes, you kind of put a finger up. 
You know, if, uh, if I ask you a second question, yes, put another finger up. Just come on your side. We'll see how well you do compared to the cardiology department at Johns Hopkins and how well you do compared to the Swedish National Academy, okay? Okay, first, <clears throat> if salad and vegetables are served and eaten first before you bring out your main course of starch, give yourself a one, okay? Second, if the main dish is served or pre-plated from the counter and not just like plopped in the middle of the, <laughs> plopped in the middle of the table where you can have seconds and thirds of pasta without even moving, give yourself another one. Third, if your dinner plates are nine to 10 inches wide, give yourself a point. If they're t more than 10 inches, you overserve yourself, sometimes by about 22%. If they're less than nine inches, you go back for seconds and thirds and fourths. Fourth, if you eat sitting at a table with the TV turned off, not a computer desk, the table, give yourself a fourth point. Fifth, if there, are two or few, if there are two or fewer cans of soft drinks in your fridge, five. If your kitchen counters are organized, not messy, give yourself a six. So we do a really cool experiment where we brought people in and we either, we had three snacks sitting on the table, on a, on a kitchen table, and we either made the rest of the room totally messy for half the people or it was really clean for half the people. If it was messy, they ate 44% more snacks in half an hour than if, the, than if there wasn't a newspaper sitting out, if there wasn't mail stacked on the table, if there weren't dirty dishes in the rack. Seven, if pre-cut fruit or vegetables are in your middle shelf of your refrigerator right today, if you went home, not like once, today, <laughs> Seven, if at least six single servings of lean protein, that could be cheese sticks or yogurt or tofu bars or whatever, if you have at least six in total, give yourself another point. Nine, if all snack foods are kept in one inconvenient cupboard, give yourself a ninth point. It, it, typical, the typical home in America has snacks in four to five different cupboards of their home. So every time you open the cupboard, it's like, snack, snack. And last, if the only fruit in your counter is a fruit bowl, give yourself a tenth point. How many people had more than five points out there? Yeah, pretty good, pretty good. I think the average for the uh, cardiologist at um, Johns Hopkins was about three. For the Royal Swedish Academy, it was about five. And for the American Family of Consumer Scientists, the Home Economics Professional Association, six. Well, let's look at our country. I think there's a lot of changes we can make in places around us, in our food radius. This afternoon, we're gonna be looking at what you can do at your work. But you can actually score stores, restaurants, and workplaces and tweet it out, tweet the score out. Slimbydesign.org has all these tools. You can let them know what to do. There's letters you can send. Or you can even organize a group that helps do this. And who benefits? They benefit and we benefit. That's what win-win activism is. My conclusion, I want to take this back to you. And this is back to what you might want to think doing as soon as you get home on Friday, I guess. Where do you want to sit when you go to a Chinese buffet? Far away and face away. Okay. How are you going to get your kids to eat green beans? <laughs> Give them a name, yeah. It's silly dilly green beans. You know, but even if they're teenagers, if you just say something about the green beans, that you know these green beans came all the way from California. <laughs> in this can. <laughs> and what do you want to put on your home counter? Yeah, both. And here's the deal, is it gonna make a difference the first week? <laughs> no! It won't even make a difference the second week. For some weird reason, these things have to be around for about two weeks before you just don't look them like a bouquet of flowers. But we find that the typical person who has a bowl of fruit <laughs> on their counter weighs on average eight pounds less than the neighbor who doesn't. Very easy change to make. Well, thank you very much for your time.